Hello there, Odd Lots listeners. You are about to hear a live episode recording of the Odd Lots podcast. Yep, this episode was recorded in front of a live audience at the Decades Bowling Alley in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. We hope you enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. And I'm Joe Weisenthal. So, Joe, uh, we can't seem to get away from semiconductors. No, we can't. And, you know, we recently talked to two of the people uh, basically running the CHIPS Act in a recent episode. Um, but I think if we're going to ask the question, like, how the CHIPS Act is going, we can't just talk to the people running it. No, we, be biased. you think? Uh, no, we need some outside perspective. And I'm very happy to say that in this very special episode of Odd Lots, which we are recording live at the Decades Bowling Alley, we are going to be speaking to two of the perfect guests. We are going to be see speaking to Dan Wong, visiting scholar at Yale Law School's Tsai China Center and tech analyst over at Gavacal Dragonomics, perhaps the only man who's ever read a full copy of the uh, Chinese Communist Party's internal policy journal from cover to cover. What's it called again? It's Kyushi. called Seeking Truth. Seeking Truth, yeah. Uh, and special guest, a last minute addition, just to keep our producers and our tech uh, audio people on their toes. We're also gonna have Adam Ozimek. He is of course, chief economist at Economic Innovation Group and also our host for this wonderful event. So thank you both so much for coming on Odd Lots. Uh, without further ado, Dan, you recently moved back to the US uh, and now you're in Lancaster at a bowling alley. Isn't it great that we're all here? Uh, no one is more surprised than me, Tracy, that we've all gotten over here. If I could heighten the surrealness of the moment uh, just a little bit, I want to point out that my parents are also here uh, in the back, uh, who drove over from their home in suburban Philadelphia. Uh, they are shy. I hope we can involve them in the bowling. Uh, Adam, are you surprised to be an economist who owns a bowling alley and to issue your own tokens? Uh, I'm a little used to it at this point, okay. but um, <laughs> I enjoy being an economist who issues my own Okay, tickets. that's fair enough. So maybe just to set the scene, I mean, Joe and I started talking about semiconductors years ago now because of supply chain shortages, which we've since gone on to explore in various ways. But in the years that have passed since, semiconductors have become like a huge policy point. Why is this of interest, in particular, um, to someone like Adam? Why does this interest you? Well, it's part of a broader discussion around industrial policy. And I think that, you know, if we're going to be trying to pick specific industries that we want to grow, um, I sort of put myself in the camp of, I think this is possible, but we have to do it very smartly. It's not easy. And so my interest in the discussion is trying to make sure we're doing this the right way to maximize the odds of success. A lot of times, you know, you sort of find two camps. There's the critics of industrial policy who just say it can't work, it's impossible. There's public choice problems, it's doomed. And then you sort of have a, another side that's just like, well, as long as we're spending the money, we're already uh, mission accomplished. They might not say that, but that's kind of how they act sometimes. <laughs> Sorry, guys. But um, I, I think we need to be critics who think it can succeed and trying to make it succeed by being critical and ensuring that it's done smartly. So, you know, one of the things, the first time we ever did a COVID related episode, it was actually with Dan. And I think it was before we knew like quite how much it was gonna change the world. And it was like a very specific, like, well, what's COVID gonna do to like essentially electronics manufacturing in, uh, in, in China? And that was like the extent to which we were thinking. I think it was like February, um, 2020. Uh, obviously, then we, you know, the world changed. We don't need to uh, re go over all of those things. But let's just start with like this simple point. When it comes to, from your perspective, can it succeed? Not like the specifics of the Chips Act yet or whatever, but do you accept the premise that the attempt to turn around domestic manufacturing of high end semiconductors in the US is conceivably possible? I think it is uh, possible. I think it is conceivably possible. And I think that we are uh, off to a good start with an emphasis on start. Now, the Financial Times uh, recently tabulated that there's something like $200 billion of new investment in clean tech, as well as in semiconductors after the passage of the IRA, as well as the CHIPS Act. Now, $200 billion is quite a lot. 
we're seeing these flurries of investments uh, in semiconductors from the likes of Samsung and TSMC, uh, as well as Intel. Um, and we're seeing also a lot of battery makers. We're seeing a lot of solar uh, photovoltaic makers announcing these very large facilities uh, in the US. So we are off to see a start. Uh, and uh, I think what I re uh, really wonder about is, you know, what exactly are the criteria for success? Mm -hmm. Is spending money uh, really just sufficient? Or as you've had the CHIPS Act administrators come on, um, tell you, you know, there has to be a little bit more. And the test that I would propose for, you know, everyone to think about um, are, I would say, you know, probably to focus on these two things. The first is, you know, what exactly is the economic criterion for success? If we are going to have, you know, a thriving chip industry, if we're going to have a thriving clean tech industry, then, uh, you know, the economics have to work out in some big way. And I think the challenge for a lot of this is that, um, you know, when I spend a lot of time looking at the clean tech supply chain in China, it is going to be pretty difficult, I think, for the United States to become a lower cost producer than China on a lot of these, uh, you know, important manufactured products. But is there some criterion here that could be met in a bit of a lower way? Are we going to see some self-sustaining dynamics uh, that is not being primarily driven by foreign investment? Are we going to be able to see, you know, the cost curve, perhaps with some help from tariffs, um, you know, be able to get us to some competitive uh, products? And then the second test I would propose that, you know, we really think about is some threshold of a national security test. Now, you know, this is really up for the national security folks in D.C. to debate what this should really mean. But what I would look at is the structure of these investments, because a lot of what we see right now in terms of, um, you know, the actual investments in chips, uh, the actual investments in clean tech, that's overwhelmingly going to the downstream industries uh, in both of these uh, sectors. We're seeing a lot of investments in the battery cells. We're seeing a lot of the investments in solar modules. But really, these are only the assemblies of all of the components uh, that you need. There hasn't been quite so much investment in the critical minerals uh, for batteries in the US. There hasn't been quite so much uh, investment in the solar cells, the solar polysilicon. This is much more difficult stuff. So if the US is um, you know, spending a lot of this money, you know, $200 billion, you know, uh, potentially far more than that, mostly to import um, products mostly made in, the, uh, in Asia, in China, and then assembling a lot of these things here. Well, it doesn't look to me like they are really going to be um, you know, pushing past that threshold. So you know, for, for ultimate measures of success, I would look at the economics and I would look at the structure of these investments. Adam, I kind of want to ask you the same question, which is how are we judging the success of this program? Because it does seem, as Dan just laid out, there are all these different targets. So on the one hand, the CHIPS Act is sort of the poster child for uh, revived, more activist industrial policy. I know that's a, a negative term in some economic circles. I've heard people call it industrial strategy instead, so maybe I'll use that. Uh, people trying to fix supply chain shortages, uh, create new jobs, um, geostrategic interests, as Dan just mentioned. Like the list of potential goals here is quite long. So how should we be judging the success of this type of program? Well, I think we need to focus. I think that's really important. And we need to focus on the goals that actually make sense versus the goals that not only do they not make sense, but they're going to be a distraction for achieving our primary goals. So if you think about you know, national security interest, I think we have a genuine economic interest in making sure that specific mature node uh, chips that we rely on for our military we have a safe and steady supply with them. Doesn't necessarily mean they need to be here. It need, means they need to be some of them here and some of them uh, on allies that we can trust. That to me seems like a completely reasonable national security concern that I don't see why even, you know, um, you know, libertarian neoclassical style economists would object to. Um, I think having the most advanced production here, there's an argument for that too, at least having some of it for the purpose of, um, you know, making it more, less geographically concentrated. Uh, you know, a, a lot of the production, what is it, 90% of advanced chips is made in Taiwan. That's a hugely risky situation. So uh, I think we think of that as like insurance. So we don't want them, all the advanced production concentrated in one place. We want it to be insured. Again, this is an area where we should be relying on allies and, and we shouldn't see it just as a goal of producing it here, but a goal of making the supply of that more resilient, less risky. I see those as reasonable policy goals. I see the idea that this is going to be um, something that creates good jobs, um, skilled or, or low skilled, as being a distraction. Um, I think that the idea that we're going to 
you know, have more resiliency in a huge variety of chips is not really realistic. I mean, there's so many chips made so many countries and, and you just, you're not going to know which ones we need to insure against. If you look at like the auto industry, um, the reason they had a chip shortage wasn't because we couldn't make enough chips for them. It's because they canceled all their chip orders early in the pandemic. And then by the time they, they realized they had made a mistake and they went to, to the uh, chip makers said, actually, we do want those chips. Classic like, bullwhip effect. Right. And so like, how are we going to solve that? And I don't really hear any clear answers about that. And even when I do hear an answer, it's sort of not fully thought out in my mind. So we're going to create mature node production here. Um, what's going to happen next time something like this happens, right? Are the automakers going to cancel their orders again? If not, then we don't have a problem. And if so, then what are we going to do? Use the Defense Production Act to seize it because it's here? It just, it seems like a solution that's a little disconnected from the problem. Well, this actually <clears throat> gets to another thing like, Dan, I mean, let's say we all, everyone were to sort of accept the, set, the national security case for domestic advanced semiconductor manufacturing. Is there another problem that we need, that actually needs to be solved beyond that? I mean, like, can we just sort of like, yeah, uh, have maybe more diversified globally or something like that? Like, it seems like, okay, yes, it's pretty crucial, the the military part. Can What about just going back to the status quo outside of that? Would that be fine? Oh, well, the wonderful thing, Joe, about national security in the U.S. is that no one can ever define it. Um, you know, it is, um, you know, it is, uh, you know, the, the president is uh, very reluctant to define it. The federal judges are always very differential about, um, you know, how the uh, U.S. president defines what national security is. Maybe we should just come up with our own definition. Um, you know, I think that I take an expansive view of, um, you know, U.S. national security. I think there should be uh, quite a lot more manufacturing jobs. Um, you know, we're speaking in uh, Pennsylvania. This is, um, you know, a site of uh, quite a lot of manufacturing. I value uh, manufacturing for its own sake. Um, I think that I love heavy industry, you know, the, the heavier, the better. Uh, and so, you know, it is, um, you know, really great that we should um, be uh, thinking about these sort of things. So, um, you know, if I were able to, you know, think about, you know, what, it, what is a good vision of all of these things, I would ideally like to see, you know, that even if automakers make some big mistakes um, in the beginning of the pandemic, cancel all their orders, that was no doubt a mistake, that somehow the, um, you know, U.S. manufacturing system is able to be somewhat robust to be able to be self-correcting enough to rescue, um, you know, a lot of these manufacturers uh, from their mistakes. Because what I was quite surprised by in the early days of the pandemic was that, you know, in the earlier days of uh, March 2020, when the U.S. had a pretty big deficiency then of masks and swabs, which were, which were simple products by any measure, there were a lot of manufacturers that were not able to quickly retool and make these pretty simple products that manufacturing employment, uh, even up until I think something like the last three months, did not uh, you know, uh, surpass the, uh, you know, uh, the peak in uh, March 2020, that it is pretty surprising that both the manufacturers and the workforce were not really able to respond in a pretty robust way and be supple enough to you know, make a lot of these types of products. And so I would start there by thinking about you know, from a workplace issue, less from an optimization, less from an um, yeah, efficiency issue, are we able to build some sort of uh, you know, workforce economic system that re responds robustly to emergencies? So just on the national security point, and, you know, I take Dan's point that this is sort of like a moving and very flexible goal, but I did see a headline float by this week basically saying that Germany is in talks to limit the export of certain chemicals that are important to chip production. I guess my question is, like, what is the ultimate goal here? Is it just to cut off chip production within China? Or is it to limit chip production in other countries that might be interested in developing it? Is the future goal that we just have, you know, a strategic industry of semiconductors that is concentrated in a few select Western countries? I'm being very careful not to use the word uh, Western bloc, but that kind of feels like we're heading. Yeah, it's um, it's a pretty um, important question, Tracy. And so, you know, what I wonder about with something like the IRA, with something like the clean tech bill, is 
what exactly is the ultimate objective of the United States government? Is it uh, to you know, decarbonize as quickly as possible, or is it to build out a clean tech supply chain um, in uh, the US as quickly as possible? Because to some extent, these two are somewhat in tension. Um, you know, China does have all the uh, solar uh, as well as quite a lot of the battery technologies. It would be much simpler to decarbonize if you just imported all of that, but that is um, you know, uh, totally not acceptable uh, you know, uh, in the present day. Now, with respect to chips, um, you know, that is uh, a little bit of a um, different story. But it, again, the, the, the targets here are not uh, terribly clear. You have the National Security Advisor, uh, Jake Sullivan, say that, you know, um, that yeah, it can't be enough for the United States to be just two generations ahead of China on semiconductors. Um, you know, they uh, really should be seeking some sort of an absolute advantage. Uh, this is someone else on the National Security Council. Uh, Tarun Chabra said, you know, we no longer want a um, comparative advantage uh, against China's technology capabilities. Uh, the U.S. really needs to have an absolute advantage. Now, if you're removing comparative, you know, if you're in the realm of the absolute, then it becomes, you know, quite a lot more difficult to figure out exactly the degree to which uh, the U.S. really needs to be ahead. But, you know, I think in general, uh, what it seems like here is that the U.S. really wants, you know, a, you know, quite a lot of the most advanced stuff, a lot of the um, uh, everything else as well. And it would be ideal if China did not get that much further out of here. So I want to go back to something I, where I sense there is some disagreement and get some debate going. And that is essentially about employment as a good thing per se. And I could see sort of your argument is like, look, if the goal is we want to have advanced chips here, then the goal should be we want to have advanced chips here. And the fact that it creates jobs, yeah, jobs are good, but that is a secondary goal. And we wouldn't want the job creation aspect to be a distraction from uh, the advanced chips. To your point, however, there is this sort of like, seems like a slightly different take, which is that, no, we want to have an economy in which a lot of people are capable of working in complex, heavy industry. And you don't get there if you don't start with employing more people in complex heavy industry and the training. I'm thinking about a recent conversation we had with Henry Williams and David Ox, like economic complexity is a really good thing and is part of what drives wealth. But maybe we could like explore this a little bit. Maybe start like, what are your concerns about the degree to which um, some of these secondary goals may undermine the main goal? And maybe like uh, sort of hear both of your perspective on whether jobs per se is a good part of the ambition. Yeah, I, I mean, I think Dan acknowledges that that we already are seeing the trade-off between domestic employment and the main goal when it comes to um, clean energy, right? I mean, we could be importing more clean energy. We be, could, could be getting, you know, cleaner, greener, faster, and we're not to preserve jobs. And the reality is the wage premium that a low-skilled person earns in manufacturing has declined massively over time. It's just not there anymore. These aren't great jobs anymore. Like, it's just not the case. We don't have a economic interest in taking someone from services to manufacturing anymore. I think a lot of what we're seeing is a relic of 10 to 20 years of a bad economy, right? Like I think we had a long, long Great Recession. And before that, we had the China shock. So it's been a long time since we've seen a legitimately good labor market. And I think people lost faith in that. They lost faith in basic macroeconomic policies ability to generate decent wage growth for people with less than a college degree. And I think that's just misplaced. I think the fundamental mistake there is macro policy. I don't think it's industrial policy. I don't think the solution to a 10 year recession is getting more people in manufacturing. And I think if we do that, we don't need to do that. Dan, do you want to defend the idea of job creation as part of uh, industrial policy? Uh, sure. Well, you know, I think um, it's impossible to disagree uh, with Adam um, that, you know, the wage premium here is not good um, in terms of a lot of manufacturing. And I think it is uh, going to be uh, pretty difficult to entice these workers uh, who are working in semiconductors to, you know, get out of, um, you know, Silicon Valley bean bags uh, and then, you know, go into these uh, fab rooms where, you know, if you ever go into one of them, they have a very strange light. It is yellowish, purplish light. You're sitting there, you know, uh, looking at, you know, these transistors for uh, eight hours a day. It is pretty strange work, um, you know, to try to do something like this. Where, yes, if you can, you know, get into those bean bags um, or, you know, if you are able to just 
work as a, let's say, in, in, uh, as a home healthcare worker, where your wages can be, you know, just as high as working in these grueling factory jobs, you know, it, it, I think that is pretty difficult to entice a lot of people to take a look at the, the situation and say, well, let's do quite a lot more manufacturing. You know, I'm uh, sitting at a law school now. Uh, I'm hardly turning wrenches all, all day. And so I, I want to be uh, the first to put up my hands and say, um, you know, this is, um, you know, uh, quite, quite challenging for me to envision, uh, you know, myself uh, as doing something like that as well. But I think, you know, in general, what I would love to do is to, you know, imbue manufacturing with a special sense of dignity. Um, let's imbue complexity with a special sense of economic dignity um, and that, you know, that we should say that culturally in general, that we should, you know, exalt manufacturing, that we should exalt economic complexity, that we should exalt the types of uh, technology that involve a lot more of this creation, because I think that is good for both the economy as well as for national security. So we managed to mention a uh, bullwhip effect and beanbags. So we just need to mention uh, mint the coin, and then we'll hit uh, like we all hit the all traditional of off talking points. Onion fugitive, right? We already futures. talked about his token operation. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, okay, so just on this point, um, Dan, maybe you can explain. So one thing I've always wondered is, you know, we talk about U.S.-China rivalry when it comes to semiconductors, but China is far behind a lot of other countries when it co comes to semiconductor technology, but it's doing pretty well, as you already mentioned, with clean tech. What are the differences between those two industries as they relate to China's economy um, and social fabric? Because I think that'll also give us some insight into whether or not this type of traditional, quote unquote, industrial policy will actually work in the U.S. Sure. So, um, you know, maybe, you know, we can um, think a little bit about where China is on most technology. And so if I can give a very quick snapshot of where China is on most of its technology endeavors, um, roping up clean tech as well as semiconductors, what I would say is that uh, I, at this point, I think China is um, pretty competitive with the US um, in manufactured products outside of two big areas. Uh, the first is semiconductors, where China is has built pretty much the basics of competition in um, all of the uh, you know semiconductor uh, production, um, but it is uh, leading in absolutely nothing. That it is uh, at best ten years behind the market leaders here. China is also really weak in something like aviation. Um, so you know, um, in terms of uh, China's answer to Airbus and Boeing, it is really really far uh, behind. Um, but outside of these two big areas, uh, again, in manufactured uh, technologies only, I would say that uh, China has broadly caught up to, uh, you know, the West uh, writ large on most manufactured products. It is leading uh, the U.S. and Europe in most of clean tech, by which I mean solar, wind, uh, batteries, as well as uh, hydrogen electrolyzers. Um, and it is, uh, you know, leading in all sorts of these boring industrial products, uh, you know, some things like hydraulic pumps, which would never grace the headlines of, you know, fine papers like Bloomberg. Um, but, the you know, Hydraulic things, Pumps Act isn't we, coming anytime soon. No, but we definitely need something uh, like that. Um, but China is, you know, leading in all of these uh, broad manufactured products where I think, you know, it is uh, weak relative to the U.S. is that I think that um, any uh, scientific area, any technology sector that involves the complex integration of different, uh, you know, scientific disciplines, China tends to be pretty weak. So in semiconductors, that involves the integration of chemistry, electrical engineering, um, you know, computer science. Aviation involves the uh, integration of material science, uh, aerodynamics, um, ma many other things. Um, this is something where the U.S. is still really, really strong at um, you know, building these advanced manufacturing products. Where the U.S. tends to be weak is where the science is pretty mature, but all of the execution risk lies with uh, manufacturing. So, you know, in anything that the manufacturing co operation is pretty complex. If I'm thinking about something like putting together a battery cell involves about a dozen different steps, everything from cell filling to final sealing, all of these demand, you know, perfect handoff between each one of these steps. Um, and this is where the uh, Chinese are really, really strong, that they learn from building iPhones, building complex electronics. They're just really good at building products, of high intricacy at high volume. Uh, and so this is where I would uh, love to see the U.S. become a little bit better at this more volume production. Adam, I want to go back to something you said, which I think is like really key, which is that, you know, perhaps some of the U.S., the, the diagnoses of the U.S., we forget that we had really many years of slack labor markets, poor demand, maybe 10 plus years of weak uh, economic growth, even going back to like 
well before the economic crisis, uh, the 2008-2009 crisis. One thing that strikes me now that I've been trying to think about is, okay, we're in this like tightening cycle with the Fed, et cetera, but there's still a lot of money coming, you know, high multiplier money, it seems like, building all these factories, batteries, chips, et cetera. Do you see, are you, like, to what extent, looking from a macro lens, do you see some of this investment allowing the U.S. to maintain robust job growth, strong economic activity, strong wages, et cetera, uh, even as a, um, you know, sort of like helping us avoid going right back into the old slump? Yeah, I mean, I think ongoing capital investment's great. It's nice to see that the interest rates haven't fully shut that down. And I think that that's, you know, sort of the risk that we're playing with right now. I think all eyes should be on growing GDP. How do we increase GDP? Um, how do we do more? Because the reality is we have had, we've had tight labor markets over the last two years, but uh, a substantial part of that has been reduced labor supply. And so, and also just the speed at which things moved, right? So I think that looking forward the next five to 10 years, I think when we think about how many people are working, we can do better. The labor market can do better. And so we shouldn't look at the amount of people working now and say, oh, we, we, we hit the lid. That's the capacity. It's over. It's really a lot of things happening that, you know, short term Nehru, Nehru is a lot realer than it ever has been. And so I think we, we should think about capital investment, growth and higher employment all as, you know, that's the next five to 10 years. That's what we should be aiming for. So just on this note, though, is there a risk that we're front loading CapEx or pulling forward too much investment at a time when the economy is arguably running hot um, and at the risk of not having, oh God, I'm about to veer into MMT territory, um, but at the risk of- The water's warm, the water's warm. <laughs> no, when the economy is slowing, maybe we won't have that fiscal um, policy or investment lever to pull. I think the economy is confusing right now. And the resilience of spending, the resilience of durable goods spending. And I wouldn't be surprised if there are a lot of factory owners and a lot of you know manufacturers across the country who don't know yet what the permanent trajectory looks like. And so given that there's uncertainty, there's, I think you know it would be surprising if there weren't people building factories that it's going to turn out that they don't need. You just hope that the economy has enough strength to sort of reabsorb that stuff as uh, companies do realize some of that malinvestment to put my Austrian hat on. Dan, going back to actually the, some of the national security questions, like, is there a level at which the U.S. can feel comfortable? And so it's in terms of like, okay, we have hit enough. Like, is there any way of even like knowing or like being able to quantify, <clears throat> excuse me, level of like, okay, the factories are up and running. Yes, probably the majority of uh, manufacturing is going to be in Taiwan or China or elsewhere in Asia. But it's like, oh, we're good here. Like, we actually did this. Like, do you, do you have any sort of analytical way of like figuring out what that number is? Uh, I think that is uh, pretty difficult to say. Um, if I had to come up with uh, my own test, it is that, you know, that the uh, United States regularly runs into problems of um, oversupply of a lot of these things uh, rather than undersupply and having, you know, basically these uh, spiraling cost curves uh, chasing after uh, fewer and fewer goods that, um, you know, at least, um, you know, again, it is hard to say what the U.S. national government uh, declares to be national security. Um, but, you know, what I would say is, you know, that, you know, if from, uh, I think, um, hopefully that the folks at um, Econ Twitter can agree on is, you know, something like, you know, to bring down the cost curve for uh, infrastructure that, you know, it is, um, it's still kind of mind blowing that these uh, subway extension lines in New York City cost about 10 times more than in, um, you know, European uh, countries that it becomes um, you know, super difficult to build these um, solar farms, to build these uh, sorts of transmission grids. Um, I never knew what an uh, obscene four-letter word NEPA was uh, until the folks at IFP uh, told me so, um, that NEPA, uh, CEQA, its close cousin, just really block uh, all sorts of development um, in the US. Um, and that you know, if we don't have you know, some sort of a robust system to save automakers from their mistakes, although these automakers make you know, probably too many mistakes to, 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 to really try to save them from, but you know, unless you, know, you are able to you know, have this sort of um, you know, robustness, bring down these cost curves, have regular problems of oversupply uh, rather than persistent undersupply, where you know, prices just keep rising uh, to chase after these goods, where it's not at all clear where 
a hundred million dollars and the New York public school system goes, it's not very clear where, you know, tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars of infrastructure investment goes, then I think we can be a little bit more at ease in thinking about having a robust economic system. Just on this point, I mean, there is a perception out there that when it comes to China, it's a command economy and, you know, Xi Jinping can wake up one day and say, we're going to make semiconductors a strategically important industry. But actually, the way that happens, it, it, it usually isn't a bunch of money thrown at that problem. It's sort of a wink and a nod to the banks and the credit providers like, hey, you should lend these guys some more money um, at cheap rates. I, I guess my question is, what kind of policy response would we expect to see from China on this front? And would they start to tweak the, their own way, their own version of industrial policy in response to what the West is doing? Yeah, I, I tend to think that, um, you know, China is uh, mostly pretty focused on building all of these uh, capacity without thinking too much um, about these other competitive forces. You know, that uh, creates a lot of these problems. Um, you know, it creates these um, usual issues of oversupply. But I think the Chinese is, um, you know, mostly thinking about its own internal system rather than, uh, you know, trying to figure out how to, you know, make the rest of the world uh, more happy. So when the Chinese decide that, you know, semiconductors are a critical technology or that solar is a critical technology, as you say, the uh, central government uh, would do something like name solar a strategic emerging industry, as the state council did in 2010. It would trigger, a, uh, you know, a vast cascade of uh, subsidies, uh, which leads to business creation. It encourages the uh, local governments to give free land to uh, favorite industries, uh, have the banks lend at uh, very cheap rates. Um, sometimes these, um, you know, direct grants. Um, but, you know, in general, what the uh, Chinese uh, tend to do is to, you know, have um, oversupply. They don't, they have no ability to stop themselves from building. And I think, you know, if I had to choose, I would, um, you know, rather choose that set of economic problems. That um, that was uh, the trigger that um, has made it so that China builds um, basically as much uh, renewable infrastructure every year as the rest of the world combined. That these Chinese local governments cannot stop themselves um, from building more, um, you know, favorite industries in uh, something like solar uh, or wind farms. Um, that what they really try to do uh, is to. You know, they can't stop themselves from building. Um, they build in, um, they build even when there is no interconnection, when these um, farms aren't really connected to the grid. They build, um, you know, hydroelectric dams that displace uh, millions of people. They build even when the central government tells them to stop building um, because, um, you know, it just wants this uh, sort of capacity and employment out there. And that is just, a, you know, that's what the U.S. is kind of up against. And I wonder, you know, how these two systems can be more adaptive. Well, this, I want to, that feeds into, so it really does feel like we have the opposite problem where people are always writing substack posts about how terrible we are at building things and then you have Dan talking about no they literally can't stop the building even when they say stop the building is it really as simple as like oh there's some laws from the Carter era that we have to get rid of and then suddenly we could like build subway and rail as fast as they do in Europe and Asia like what to you like just setting aside like this idea of like how do we get to do to get the U.S. building again? How do you like rank the priorities or get good at that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there are important laws to change, but I think what we have to understand is that a lot of the blockers, to, like, why are those laws there, right? Yeah. Like, we can't just like erase them and say they should be gone to be gone. A, a lot of the the blockers to lower cost are there because someone wants them to be there, sure. and because we don't have enough you know, bipartisan, cross-ideological agreement that these things should go. You know what I mean? All we have to do is get enough people to agree that Buy America is a problem, and then we can get rid of Buy American provisions. But, like, is the law the problem? Yes, to an extent, but the problem is, for whatever reason, we can't overcome the forces that like, push for you know, it. No, but there's also, like, I mean, Buy America, I presume, is not why it took forever with the Second Avenue subway, which I don't know if that even exists or maybe it has a few stops, and why there are like large swaths of the country where they can't put uh, electrical wires and stuff like, like there seems to be like, it seems like there's more than that. Sure, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of problems and behind most of those problems, there's some party pushing for them. And I would argue that what we need is more ideological alignment among the people who wish to push back against those things. You know, like NEPA is a huge issue, right? But like it exists for a reason, it's defended for a reason, there are people who sue using NEPA because, you know, that's that they want those outcomes. And so 
we need to have more agreement. Here are the set of problems and sort of yeah. work in a bipartisan way to, to, to push behind them. And you have to be realistic about people are on the other side of the table of the everything bagel problem. And they, that's who we're up against if we're gonna get rid of it. Just going back to the beginning of this conversation when we were talking about the goals of um, the CHIPS Act and the IRA as well, it does feel like there is a tension between a recognition that these are strategically important things for the U.S., whether they're semiconductors or clean energy tech, and then the ability to actually scale these and sell them um, in a way that is appealing to uh, American people and corporations. Is that tension insurmountable? I'd like to hear from both of you on this point. Um, I think it is uh, probably going to be a pretty serious tension. And I think that the um, U.S. government has to work through, um, you know, all, all these sorts of uh, tensions. Some of these things will be resolved through uh, the executive process. So I think about something like, you know, the Treasury Department will give guidance on which electric vehicles are actually subject to the full $7,500 in subsidies uh, from the IRA. And so it has to thread these needles uh, if it is, you know, a little bit too tight then you know, the um, electric vehicle uh, uh, industry uptake will be pretty slow because most of these batteries are used with uh, minerals processed uh, in China. Um, on the other hand, if it, is, um, you know, if it is too strict, then no one will buy electric vehicles. If it is um, not strict enough, then none of these automakers feel that they have to you know, um, get rid of their China dependence on uh, all of these batteries. And so these are basically a lot of these tensions that uh, I think are uh, you know, going to be pretty difficult uh, to try to solve. Adam? I think there's a couple of important facts that, are, that matter here. One is that we have a huge cost gap, especially when it comes to advanced semiconductor production. You know, TSMC says it's 40 to 50%. So it's too expensive to start. We used to make it here and we don't anymore. And that's for a reason. And the reason is because of costs and you know, it made more sense to make it in other countries. So you have to be laser focused on those costs because of the third reason, which is this is a globally competitive industry. It's ruthless and you have to be focused on costs and you have to be focused on prices and policy should reflect that. And if policy doesn't reflect that, I think that's a problem. If I can um, amplify that point a little bit, that um, you know, I think that you know what is really strange when it comes to something like um, clean tech uh, in uh, the United States is that I think the uh, U.S. is in a very strange position where it is trying to engage in technological catch up with a lower wage competitor, which is China. That China makes, um, you know, uh, solar photovoltaic panels that are both cheaper as well as more efficient uh, than the U.S. Um, and uh, you know, often the same goes for batteries. And so, you know, usually one of these things is not true. That you know, you are either technologically ahead or uh, you are cheaper. But the U.S. Um, really has a hard time here, which is why I want to echo uh, Adam's point that you really have to focus on bringing down this cost curve. The other, um, you know, slightly novel thing is that, you know, uh, China developed technologically by embracing uh, a lot of uh, uh, foreign investment uh, into China. These involved, you know, Apple through Foxconn building enormous enormous electronics factories um, in, in China. Tesla has a, a wholly owned uh, factory uh, in Shanghai that, um, you know, Intel, Dell, whatever. Um, all of these American technology giants uh, invested a lot in China, and then Beijing was extremely welcoming um, into uh, in their investment and has not, you know, retaliated against them uh, throughout the many years of President Trump's trade war. Um, by contrast, the U.S. has become pretty hostile towards attracting uh, investment from, you know, what is the technology leader in a lot of these spaces, China, when it comes to solar uh, and batteries especially. And so it is uh, pretty hostile towards Chinese battery makers from setting up in Virginia, um, sometimes, um, you know, in, in, including in Michigan. And so I think, you know, the U.S. is making this bet that it is, 
going to be able to be okay in something like batteries by you know, mostly working with allies in Japan as well as South Korea. And perhaps that is all, all, all very fine, but I would also encourage it not to be you know, boxing with uh, one hand uh, tied behind its back, to be a little bit more like China and then try to get as much investment as possible, solve and mitigate these national security problems where they exist, but don't really you know, reject foreign investment from the technology leader. So going back to Chip specifically mentioned at the top, Trace and I recently interviewed two of the top people at uh, running the Chips Act in the US. And it, it was totally fluke timing, because like a week before that, our colleagues on the Bloomberg opinion side, who were like, you know, separate wall between us, like they totally savaged the state of the Chips Act. And like, you know, a lot of these accusations, like, oh, this is becoming like this, like progressive Christmas tree of like, environmental concerns and uh, oh, child child care, et cetera. Like outside of like what you see, um, you know, is this sort of like the tensions goals of like create jobs versus create advanced semiconductors. How concerned are you about some of these other elements or like how overblown or where do you stand on some of the other priorities that some are saying are seeping into the CHIPS Act? Yeah, I mean, I think 100% that there are other priorities that are just direct, they're just going to raise costs. Like, this is what they do. Like, there's no world in which forcing project labor agreements under the construction of these fabs doesn't raise costs. And you have to acknowledge that that's the problem. You got to be realistic about that. So I think that they are absolutely intention. I wouldn't be a two-handed economist here. That There's a lot of stuff that they that they are doing and saying that I think is good. There's a, there's a recognition um, you know, from the administration that we are going to need to nest semiconductor production within globalization. And there's a realism there and a desire to work with allies on this that I think is missing from a lot of the other discussion around this. So we're not going to make it all. And globalization is not the enemy here. Globalization is a key factor in why Moore's law has continued over time. If we didn't have globalization, we, Moore's law would have been dead a long time ago. And so you cannot run away from globalization when it comes to semiconductor production. So I do want to say that I do think the administration has been good on that. It's the other things. It's the Christmas tree stuff that I think is a problem. Uh, on the other hand, uh, everything bagels are delicious. Uh, I don't uh, order plain bagels myself, um, and Christmas trees are beautiful. I agree with Adam that um, you know it is uh, really difficult um, to try to make um, everything uh, here at home. Um, but you know, I, I wonder to what extent that um, these childcare provisions, that these other labor provisions, are really um, you know going to be mostly inconveniences that um, these companies are going to be able to write off that, um, you know, or whether they actually are critical, um, you know, um, if they actually are crippling. I, I, it may be a little bit too early to tell, um, but I, I agree with Adam. Certainly it is pretty difficult, which is why I go back to the test I laid out at the beginning. But we are seeing as already huge amounts of investments um, in the US, but, you know, is it going to be invested in most of the right things? Um, and, uh, you know, is there going to be some way to, you know, have the, um, is the US going to be able to say that these economics um, are going to be uh, pretty self-sustaining uh, over the longer run. So I just have one last question, sort of a classic interview question, which is in 10 years time, or I, I don't even know if 10 years is long enough because we're talking about technologies with very, very long lead times. But OK, so I guess I have two questions. One. What time frame do you think is reasonable to judge the success? To clear a verdict. Yeah. And then two, what are you looking out for? Is there something specific where you would wake up in 20 or 30 or 50 years time, hopefully we're all still around, um, and say this has either been a massive success or a desperate failure? Um, I look forward to uh, uh, getting back into this bowling alley in 10 years, one decade from now. Um, and, decades, you know, perfect. Decades, yes, um, or perhaps many decades. Um, uh, and, you know, thinking about um, where we are, that, um, you know, 10 years is um, uh, not uh, very long uh, of a time, as you say, Tracy, um, technologically. Um, politically, that also tends to be uh, not too long of a time. Um, for the Chinese, that is only two terms of the five-year plan. And so I think they judge uh, things on a slightly longer time scale. Let's give it at least three uh, five-year plan cycles. Um, what I slightly worry about is that, you know, there is uh, quite a lot of investment in things like solar and batteries um, and also in semiconductors in the U.S. today. Um, what I worry about is that, you know, somehow the uh, TSMC facility in uh, Arizona 
turns a little bit more like a showcase factory that doesn't end up uh, you know, producing too much. But, uh, and I think the example here is something like um, Apple's Mac Pro factory in Texas, which doesn't have uh, very high volume. Um, and um, you know, if after all this investment, a lot of firms will fail. I think that is uh, certainly going to be the case. Even two, three years from now, you know, we take a look back. Uh, you know, if you know one of the parties points out a lot of these failures and says, you know, this is why industrial policy cannot work. We're getting a lot more cylindras. They're still talking about these um, the cylindra failure of about um, you know 15 years ago now. That you know um, politically the appetite disappears to continue uh, investing in these sort of things. Um, that is something I am uh, a little bit uh, worried about, and so therefore I would say that um, you know we have to think about these things uh, on the longer time frame. Adam, I would say it depends what we're talking about specifically. So if we're talking about advanced semiconductor production, it'd be nice to have a little bit more you know less geographic concentration there, both onshore and you know in friendshore. Um, when it comes to um, you know mature node chips, I'd love to see more direct accounting for here's why we need it and here's how we've improved resiliency. When it comes to solar, what I'd love to see is the cost curve come down. I think that's everything. That's everything. I, I don't care about making it here. I don't care where we make it. I care that the price comes down and I care that people install it. And I think that we should think about the technological frontier as being something really important here. And, and chips, to be fair, is spending billions of dollars on R&D, too. So I'd love to see that some of that money helped move the technological frontier forward. I think Alan uh, Staff is here somewhere. He's always posting the solar chart, and it always looks very encouraging that that line is going down. So that does seem to be happening. One last thing, and then I want to like open up, and then I think we can uh, go to Q&A. But Dan, you know, like, I'm really struck by the point that you make about it's kind of rare to be trying to catch up to a country that both is cheaper and more technologically advanced. Like usually maybe there's one or the other and you exploit the other. Like should we be doing things like, you know, export discipline and subsidizing the uh, companies that can produce here and sell well in the global market? Should we be thinking about that type of thing for the US or should we be thinking about, you know, more buyer of last resort things? Like seems to be a part of the sort of when we have had successful like sort of like military driven uh, semiconductor thing, um, policies like back in the uh, Cold War and stuff like that? Yeah, uh, well, I would love for US firms to have export discipline, which is, uh, you know, a lot of the, the, the strategy for firms in Asia to, you know, sell to the uh, rich American market uh, and then, you know, get the um, quality of their products, uh, you know, to, to, to raise the quality of their products. The challenge for the U.S. is that there is no bigger and more sophisticated market, so it's hard to, you know, figure out, um, you know, who is able to discipline the American firm. And I think to add to the point of, you know, how, you know, the um, U.S. is in a bit of a tougher position. Again, I would think, uh, you know, slightly politically, the challenges here. To go back to the example of chips, um, you know, whether the Chips Act is working, I think about something like uh, TSMC in Taiwan, and so TSMC is. Um, you know, by miles and miles, uh, Taiwan's uh, everyone's favorite employer in Taiwan that people, uh, engineers in Taiwan would say, I would sell my liver to go work for TSMC. You know, it's much more difficult to think that people would say that of any chip firm uh, over here. You know, Taiwan is periodically in a drought. Uh, it is a, uh, you know, an island where they give the uh, fresh water to TSMC and make the citizens drink the treated water. In a drought, they park a lot of these fire trucks uh, outside of the facilities of TSMC in order to make sure that TSMC has, um, you know, uh, fresh water to produce the chips powering our iPhones. Um, and so, you know, this is, um, you know, that is just a, a different sort of thing where politically also, um, can I, uh, is it really easy to imagine that TSMC's facilities in Arizona, a fairly dry state, um, is able to park uh, a lot of fire trucks outside of TSMC's facilities in a trout, I wonder. We're going to be doing an episode soon with an Arizona alfalfa farmer, so he will be making the case that we should not, you know, they got to get their, uh, they got to get theirs too. Yeah, but thank you, Dan, for leaving with us with that wonderful vision of late stage capitalism. Um, and thank you to Adam Ozimek for joining us for this conversation. We welcomed questions from the audience, and if you'd like to hear those, we invite you to be on the lookout for live recordings where you can be part of our audience in the future.
Joe, I found that conversation fascinating. I loved it. It was so great. I'm so glad. I uh, appreciate both perspectives. Um, I do find, like, I don't know. I, I'm, I, I really, I appreciate both perspectives. I like Dan's case for we should do big, heavy stuff here. I, <laughs> I guess I have some sympathy for it. But uh, no, that was great. I really enjoyed it. One thing that I think is pretty special about the discussion is it has to be a first for a semiconductor policy yeah. discussion in a bowling alley. You no, know, and the listeners who are not here, like we're on this stage, we're looking out at bowling alley, we're looking at this beautiful light fixture in this old building. I had the exact same thought. Like, no one is having this conversation about like the a history world of first. industrial policy in this context before. So if nothing else, uh, quite an accomplishment. No, it's bowling pins. Which makes me really bullish on America, actually. You know, there's like, this is what we, we're good at. We can draw the line between bowling pins and pin diodes. How there about that? <laughs> All right. Uh, well, this has been another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. I'm Joe Washington. And big thanks to our guests, Dan Wong and Adam Ozemek. And of course, Adam, for uh, this incredible location where we recorded. And, uh, A thanks. massive thank you to the Economic Innovation yes. Group and the Institute for Progress uh, for allowing us to be here and, and do this world first of talking semiconductors in bowling alley territory. You can follow me on Twitter at Tracy Alloway. And I'm Joe Weisenthal, and you can follow me on Twitter at The Stalwart. Follow our guests on Twitter, Adam Ozemek, he's at Modeled Behavior, and Dan Wong, he's at Dan W. Wong. Follow our producers, Carmen Rodriguez at Carmen Armin and Dashiell Bennett at Dashbot, and check out all of the Bloomberg podcasts under the handle at podcasts. And for more Odd Lots content, go to Bloomberg.com slash Odd Lots, where Tracy and I have a blog, we post transcripts, and we have a newsletter that comes out every Friday. And for more Odd Lots content, check out our Discord. It's really fun. People are chatting in there 24-7 about all of the things we talk about on the show. Check it out at discord.gg slash oddlots. Thanks for listening.